Hi, and thank you for choosing Prophecy. In this video, we'll give you an overview of the event-based sensor setting, also known as the biases, and we'll provide some guidance on their tuning for different applications. We'll also show a demo on live bias tuning using our EVK4 with the IMX636 sensor. This video targets all kinds of engineers working with the event-based cameras. As a prerequisite, we do expect you to have one of the Prophecy EVKs or RDKs, and we also encourage you to watch the Introduction to Event-Based Vision Sensors video on our YouTube channel to get to know more about the event-based sensor and the basic characteristics which are impacted by tuning the sensor settings. What we'll cover is the need for the sensor settings, the sensor tuning at different levels, and the demo. Let's start with the first topic and see the need behind these sensor settings. These sensor settings, or the biases, allow you to tune the event-based sensor for the optimal function in different environmental conditions and for the best performance in specific applications. Tuning your sensor can be used to improve your data quality, for example, by improving the pixel sensitivity in the case of low contrast objects, or to speed up pixels in case of high speed motion, or to remove different types of background noise or active noise. Tuning the sensor settings will allow you to concentrate on the relevant information in the scene and only acquire the useful data containing the objects of interest and their motion and excluding other useless data or noise, therefore simplifying the data analysis and processing. Tuning the sensor settings is also used to keep control on the data rate, optimize the readout, and keep a reasonable amount of data to transfer, process, or store. Here's an example of a scene that can be viewed by an event-based camera. In the scene, there's a lot of information and various activities happening. You can see that there are some low versus high contrast areas that could be addressed better by adjusting the pixel sensitivity of the contrast change. You can also see some low versus high speed motion that can be enhanced by adjusting the pixel latency or filtered out by using the low pass or the high pass filters. And you'll notice some light flickering considered as the electronic noise, and you can filter that out with the low pass filter. You'll also notice that the high versus low illumination shouldn't pose any problem for the event-based sensor as it is inherently high dynamic range. Sensor tuning can be performed at different levels. At the pixel level, you can adjust the bias settings denoting the contrast sensitivity, the low and high pass filters, and the refractory period. On the sensor readout level, you can optimize the readout by setting one or multiple regions of interest or non-interest. And on the digital level, by doing digital event filtering, for example, using digital crop, anti-flicker, event filtering, event rate control, and event compression. We would like to draw your attention to the fact that if every pixel in the sensor array performs a change detection at the same time, then theoretically, we can reach several giga events per second. However, the capacity of the readout, for example, on the IMX636 sensor, is limited to three giga events per second. And this is the reason why you need to control your event rate by concentrating on the most useful information without acquiring too much noise to optimize the work of the readout without saturating it. In addition, there could be other constraints imposed by a processing unit. For example, we could expect to process real time only a few hundreds of mega events per second on a laptop and a few dozens of mega events per second on an MPU or an embedded platform. In this video, we're going to cover only the analog settings, such as the biases and the region of interest. Let's start with the bias settings, namely the contrast sensitivity biases. The main function of an event-based sensor is contrast detection. Each pixel detects temporal contrast changes autonomously and independently as described in the Introduction to the Event-Based Sensor video. Here, we do a quick reminder of this process. An event is generated by a pixel when its comparator voltage crosses one of the contrast sensitivity thresholds, on or off, shown by pink and purple colors respectively. Once an event is generated, the pixel comparator voltage is reset to the reference value defined via the bias diff, and then the process of detecting a new contrast change repeats. We recommend to keep the reference voltage defined by bias diff unchanged. However, both on and off thresholds can be adjusted via the bias diff on, which will control the pixel sensitivity to positive light changes, or bias diff off, which controls the pixel sensitivity to negative light changes. Note that on the IMX636 sensor, 
All of the bias values are trimmed during a calibration procedure in the manufacturing process, and all default bias values are set to zero in the Metavision software. Adjusting bias diff on and bias diff off allows the sensor to be more or less sensitive to contrast changes. As a simple example, a high contrast on this picture can be detected with a large contrast sensitivity threshold. However, a low contrast here requires only a small contrast sensitivity threshold to be detected. When adjusting contrast sensitivity biases, you need to consider the trade-off between the sensor sensitivity and the generated background rate. Here, we'll describe the effect of adjusting the contrast sensitivity thresholds. Decreasing your contrast sensitivity threshold means decreasing your bias diff on and bias diff off values in case of using an IMX636 sensor. Note that the relation between the contrast sensitivity thresholds and the corresponding biases will differ between the sensor generations. In this video, we'll mainly give examples for the IMX636 sensor. If you use another sensor, then we advise you to check the datasheet for your sensor. Some effects of decreasing contrast sensitivity thresholds can improve the pixel sensitivity. It'll also increase the background rate, meaning the number of events generated under the constant and static illumination without any activity in the scene. It can generate stuck on or crazy pixels. These pixels generate events much more often than other pixels. However, it will improve the pixel latency, which is quite advantageous for a number of applications. The effect of increasing the contrast sensitivity thresholds, meaning that on the IMX636 sensor, you'll increase the bias diff on and bias diff off values. This reduces the overall pixel sensitivity. However, it does decrease the background rate and it will reduce the number of generated events, but it will deteriorate the pixel latency. Now we'll give some examples of adjusting the contrast sensitivity biases. As our target object, we'll use a circular pattern with gray level segments and the pattern is rotated clockwise at a high speed. We'll show the data acquired by the sensor with three different types of settings. The default settings, a low contrast sensitivity threshold, and a large contrast sensitivity threshold. Under the default settings, the sensor detects all edges with all contrast changes in the pattern. You can also see some background noise visible. Now using a small contrast sensitivity threshold to make the sensor very sensitive, the sensor detects all the edges with the contrast changes in the pattern and the edges are very clear. However, as a drawback of this setting, the sensor generates quite a lot of background noise. Using a large contrast sensitivity threshold will make the sensor far less sensitive. The sensor starts missing some of the edges. There's no background noise in the data and the event rate is much lower. As a side effect of this setting, the pixel latency jitter are higher, which makes the edges less clear. Now we'll look at the contrast sensitivity biases in various applications. Decreasing your contrast sensitivity thresholds to improve pixel sensitivity is mainly used in applications where you have low contrast objects or textures or semi-transparent objects or defects, like in the example below with the semi-transparent low contrast defects on the surface. Increasing your contrast sensitivity threshold to decrease the event rate is used in applications where you have noisy environments and or crowded scenes, like in the example below with loads of details in the city, or when you have high contrast objects. Now we'll move on to the analog settings where we'll see the usage of the low pass and the high pass filters. The high pass and low pass filters allow you to control the range of frequencies detected by the event-based sensor, and they are managed via the biases. Bias HPF controls the pixel high pass cutoff frequency. Adjusting the bias HPF allows you to filter out low frequencies, including slow motion and noise. Bias FO controls the pixel low pass cutoff frequency. Adjusting bias FO allows you to filter out high frequencies, including fast motion and flickering, or the opposite, extend the range of detected high frequencies that is limited by the default settings. When adjusting the low pass filter, you need to consider the trade off between the pixel latency and noise. Decreasing the low pass filter means decreasing the bias FO value. For the IMX636 sensor, when you decrease the low pass filter, it will smooth the signal, increase the pixel latency, it particularly impacts fast moving objects, it'll remove high frequencies, and it will reduce the background rate, the noise, and the generated event rate. Increasing the low pass filter means increasing the bias FO for the IMX636 sensor, and it will improve the pixel latency. 
Latency does also depend on the light level. Low latency can be needed for fast moving objects. This will expand the range of observed high frequencies, but it will also increase the background rate, noise, and event rate. As the event rate increases when increasing bias FO, we suggest you to increase the high pass filter too to remove noise and decrease the overall event rate. Now we'll give some examples of adjusting the low pass filter or bias FO. As our target object, we'll use a blinking LED installed in front of the camera. We've also connected a trigger in signal from the LED driver to the camera indicating the time when the LED is turning on. We'll show the acquired event data in a raster plot view and we'll compare the data acquired by the sensor with three types of settings. The default low pass filter settings, the minimal settings, and the maximum low pass filter settings. In the raster plot, the horizontal axis shows the event timestamps and the vertical axis shows the X coordinates of the events. The events are shown by orange dots. The trigger signal is shown by a green vertical line and it helps to determine the latency of the acquired event data compared to the trigger time. Under the default low pass filter setting, there is some pixel latency visible as a response time delay from the trigger time to the generated events. With the minimal low pass filter settings, you can see a result in a higher pixel latency or a longer pixel response time from the trigger signal to the generated event and a higher pixel mismatch or a larger variation between the pixel response times. Using the maximum low pass filter settings, you'll notice a much lower pixel latency or a shorter pixel response time from the trigger signal to the generated events and or a smaller variation between the pixel response times. Decreasing the low pass filter for removing high frequency noise is used in applications with flickering light, like in the example below or with useless high-speed changes. Increasing the low-pass filter for improving the pixel latency is used mainly in applications where you have high object speed or some type of high optical magnification, like in the example below with the particles. Now we can focus on the high-pass filter. When adjusting the high-pass filter, you do need to consider the trade-off between detecting low frequencies or slow motion and the generated event rate. Decreasing the high pass filter, or keeping the default bias HPF value for the IMX636 sensor, would preserve the low frequency signal. It preserves slow motion and increases the event rate, including low frequency noise. Increasing the high pass filter, meaning increasing the bias HPF for the IMX636 sensor, will remove low frequency signals, remove the slow motion, and therefore decrease the event rate, including the low frequency noise. Here we'll give some examples of adjusting the high pass filter or the bias HPF. As our target object, we'll use the circular pattern with gray level segments, and the pattern is rotated clockwise at a high speed. We'll show the data acquired by the sensor with two types of settings. The minimal high pass filter settings, that is also the default setting for the IMX636, and the maximum high pass filter setting. Under the minimum high pass filter setting, the sensor detects all edges but generates more events and more noise. Increasing the high pass filter to its maximum value allows you to remove relatively slow motion in the center of the pattern or the low frequency signal and also generate fewer events and less noise. Decreasing the high pass filter is used in applications with low frequency signals or slow motion or low noise, for example, under good lighting conditions or outdoor, like in the examples below with the walking pedestrians. Increasing high pass filter is used in applications with high speed motion when we already have increased the low pass filter, for example, increased bias FO for the IMX636. Note that increasing the low pass filter increases the event rate, and therefore we recommend to compensate for it by applying the high pass filter to decrease the event rate. In the example below, we did it for the particle falling at the high speed. Or you can also use it in applications with high event rates or noisy environments. Now we're going to see the usage of the refractory period bias. The refractory period controls the pixel refractory time or the dead time during which the pixel does not detect contrast changes. When adjusting the refractory period, you need to consider the trade-off between the pixel availability and the generated event rate. Decreasing the pixel refractory period, meaning increasing the bias refractory for the IMX636 sensor, will increase the number of events triggered by the same contrast change. In the data example below, the refractory period is short that allows you to generate more events for the same contrast change. 
It also simplifies signal tracking due to acquiring more events over time. Increasing the pixel refractory period, meaning decreasing the bias refractory for the IMX636 sensor, will reduce the number of events triggered by the same contrast change. In the data example below, the refractory period is long that results in generating fewer events compared to the corresponding plot on the left, and therefore a lower event rate. It can be used to remove one polarity for periodic high-frequency signals. In the data example below on the right, the refractory period is long and thus the pixel detects only one rising edge of the signal without detecting the falling edge. This technique can be used to skip one polarity in case of a periodic high-frequency signal for which the frequency is stable and known. Now we'll give some examples of adjusting the refractory period. As a target object, we'll use a circular pattern with gray level segments and the pattern is rotated clockwise at a high speed. And we'll show you the data acquired by the sensor with three types of settings. The default refractory period, a short refractory period, and a long refractory period. Under the default refractory period setting, you can see that the sensor detects all edges. Under the short refractory period, this results in multiple edge detection. It also generates more events and more noise. The long refractory period results in generating fewer events and less noise. Decreasing the refractory period to improve the pixel availability is used in applications where you have high object speed or you have a need for high speed tracking like in the example below with the particles moving at a high speed. Increasing the refractory period to decrease the amount of generated events is used in applications where you have an extraordinarily high event rate or you have the need of a single polarity like in the example below with the laser scan that can produce high event rates and in some cases require only a single polarity to track. Now that we've finished with the bias settings, we're going to see the usage of the region of interest or non-interest. In the event-based sensor, each pixel can be set in one of two states, active meaning producing events on detecting a contrast change, Reset, meaning that the pixel doesn't perform any detection, it does not generate events. Pixel states can be set via a region of interest that defines the only active area of the sensor, or a region of non-interest that defines the inactive area of the sensor. In the examples here, we show active pixels in light blue and the reset pixels in yellow. The objectives of using ROIs or RONIs are focusing on a region of a scene and not the full field of view, reducing the overall event rate, limiting your dynamic power consumption, simplifying and optimizing the readout of the sensor. The readout processes events from the same row in parallel, therefore reducing the number of active rows optimizes the readout. One or several ROIs or RONIs can be defined. When using an ROI or RONI, a trade-off between the number of active pixels and generated event rate should be considered. Here we'll show some examples of configurations of ROIs and RONIs. Active pixels are shown again in light blue and reset pixels in yellow. We'll take a look at single ROI or RONIs, row subsampling, column subsampling, and row and column subsampling. Now we'll show two concrete examples of applications with an ROI setting. In the first case, setting a single or multiple ROI can be used in applications with the object only taking a portion of the FOV, like in the example below with the motor, or a high event rate. In the second case, a row subsampling is used in applications with linear object motion over the field of view, like in the example below with the falling particles moving linearly. Other possible examples can be objects moving on a conveyor belt, surface inspection with linear motion, and high event rate. Now we'll do a demonstration on the bias tuning for the IMX636 sensor using the EVK4. As a target object, we'll use a circular pattern with four gray level segments, one black, one gray, and two white segments. The pattern is rotated by a motor, and we're going to change the rotation speed of the motor using this knob. The data from the EVK4 are transferred to the laptop and visualized using MetaVision Studio in MetaVision Studio, we will adjust the biases using the settings panel and also we will see the statistics on the generated event rate. At first, we're going to rotate the pattern at a relatively slow speed. 
And we see that the sensor with the default biases produces already quite good data from this pattern, and it can distinguish all four edges corresponding to the four segments on the pattern. We'll start the bias tuning with the contrast biases, the bias div off and bias div on. We set both biases to their maximum values to make the sensor less sensitive. As a result of the less sensitive setting, the sensor can distinguish only two edges with high contrast changes out of the four edges. Next, we'll reset the biases to their default settings, and we'll set the contrast biases to their minimum values to make the sensor very sensitive. As a result, we see more events and quite a lot of noise that don't add value for this target object as the contrast in the pattern is already quite high. Finally, we'll reset the biases back to the default bias setting. In this part of the demo, we'll change the target object to a blinking LED. We're still going to tune the biases on the same IMX636 sensor using the EVK4. The LED is controlled by the driver that generates a square wave signal at 1 kHz frequency. The same driver switches the LED on and off and also sends an external trigger signal to the EVK4 via this trigger cable. We'll use this external trigger signal to identify the exact time when the LED is turning on or off, and it will help us to determine the time needed for the pixels to detect the LED contrast change and generate events. Therefore, it'll help us to better understand the pixel latency and jitter. Now we'll start the LED. The EVK4 should see the LED visually, and it should also receive the external trigger signal. The data from the EVK4 are visualized on the laptop using the Introspect software. Here's the 2D view of the acquired event data. The data are acquired not from the full field of view, but from the small region of interest. The ROI is defined here, and its size is 100 by 20 pixels. We can see the corresponding rectangular region in the center of the field of view. Now, we'll switch our attention over to a raster view because it allows us to better understand the data over time, and it provides complementary information on the temporal distribution of the data. The raster view here contains 10 milliseconds of data. Considering the frequency of our blinking LED at 1 kilohertz, we get about 10 periods of the LED turning on and off inside this raster view. The horizontal axis of the raster view corresponds to the timestamps of the generated events, and the vertical axis corresponds to the positions of the events. Here, all X and Y positions are presented as a sequential 1D coordinate. Events generated by the event-based camera are shown as 2D points in the raster view. On events are shown by the blue points, and they correspond to the LED turning on. Off events are shown by the orange points, and they correspond to the LED turning off. The external trigger signals are shown by vertical lines. The on trigger signals are shown by the green lines, and the off trigger signals are shown by the red lines. Initially, the sensor starts with all biases set to their default values. The biases can be controlled using this settings panel. We're going to adjust the biases one by one. We'll start with the contrast sensitivity biases bias diff on and bias diff off. We'll increase both of these biases to make the sensor less sensitive. And at some point, the sensor doesn't detect the LED anymore because the sensor settings are not sensitive enough to detect the LED on off contrast change. We'll reset the biases to their default values and the sensor detects the LEDs again and we can see the generated events once more. With the next test, we can make the sensor more sensitive but as it doesn't bring us any more information, as the LED signal is already well detected with the default bias settings. Thus, we can reset the biases back to their default settings. Now we can look at the effect of the bandwidth biases. We'll start with the low pass filter, bias FO. We'll decrease the bias FO, which results in removing high frequency signals. At some point, the sensor doesn't generate events for the LED anymore because all events are filtered by this low pass filter. When we reset the bias FO to its default value, we can see the events return. Let's do another test by decreasing the bias FO a little bit to some intermediate value without removing the events completely. We can see the LED, but the data are very noisy. If we zoom in, we can see that the events are widely spread over time. The pixel latency can be seen here as a distance from the trigger, the vertical line, to the generated events, and the pixel latency is quite high here.
The pixel mismatch can be seen as a variation of the pixel's reaction times over the horizontal axes is also high. Once we reset the bias FO to its default value, the pixel latency becomes much smaller and the signal looks much better. If we increase the bias FO, the pixel latency decreases, especially it's visible for positive events. For negative events, we see some noise. If we reset the bias FO to its default value, the pixel latency becomes higher. It's not a large change as the default IMX636 sensor settings are quite fast and the default bias FO value is already high. But there is still some difference in pixel latency and jitter that can be visible. Next, we'll adjust the high pass filter, the bias HPF. By default on the IMX636 sensor, the high pass filter is off. We'll increase the bias HPF value, which activates the high pass filter and we can see the low frequency noise is removed. However, the signal is preserved. We can also mention that there is a difference in the event rate. For example, the current high bias HPF value produces the event rate of about 5 million events per second. If we reset the bias HPF to its default value, then the event rate increases to 6.5 million events per second. Finally, we can move on to the advanced biases, and we're going to adjust the refractory period. This bias defines the refractory time during which a pixel doesn't generate events. We can increase the refractory bias value, which decreases the pixel refractory time. We can see that this bias setting results in multiple signal detection, and every pixel generates multiple events per one rising or falling edge, meaning several events per one cycle of the LED turning on and off. The event rate is increased to about 12.8 million events per second, which is almost twice compared to the default settings. If we reset the refractory bias, then the event rate drops back down to the 6.5 million events per second. Next, we can decrease the refractory bias, which increases the pixel refractory time. As a result, the sensor generates fewer events. After generating a single event, the pixel will sleep and not generate any events for a duration, as we can see here. This setting removes a lot of noise in our case. The event rate also drops to about 2 million events per second. Now we can return back to our initial settings and we can reset all of our biases to their default values to remind you of the initial data. We hope that this demo gives you some insights on the effects of the bias tuning and helps you to be able to understand how to tune your sensor for your application requirements. To summarize, our basic guidance on tuning the event-based sensor settings for your applications includes the following steps. First of all, assess the data visually. You can use any viewer, for example, MetaVision Studio, and see what are the issues and what do you want to improve in your data. You can optimize your setup by adjusting your focus, ensuring that you'll see the object well. You can check out our training video on focusing the event-based camera if you have any concerns or questions. Select the right illumination. You can also adjust the sensor orientation to optimize the readout. After you've optimized your setup, now you can adjust the sensor settings. Firstly, select your ROI or RONI to concentrate on the part of the scene and to reduce your overall event rate. Next, you'll tune the biases. Now, while there are some suggestions on what to tune first, there is no specific right or wrong way to tune your biases. First, you'll adjust the bias FO to reduce the impacts of the rapidly fluctuating light or the high frequencies. Then, you'll update the bias HPF to reduce the background noise and the lower frequencies. Finally, you can adjust the bias diff on and the bias diff off to adapt the contrast sensitivity to your application. Following this, you can use the event signal processing filters embedded in the sensor to further adjust the data. In this video, we've given a general overview on the sensor settings, and we've seen which sensor settings are available, why we tune the specific sensor settings, the effect of the bias tuning, and examples of the application. We've also learned that the default biases can be used for some applications, but they're not always optimal. The data quality can be improved by the bias tuning, and each bias can be tuned for several reasons. More details can be found within our documentation and publications. See the useful links in the description below the video. We look forward to your feedback. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next videos.